Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Today we're talking rare metals and their crucial and pivotal role in energy transition and digitization more broadly. However, it comes at huge environmental cost. And as the West has offshored that environmental cost to the East, in particular to China, those countries have started to gain preeminence and even dominance in the manufacturing and processing of not just the rare metals themselves, but also the technologies that they go into. What does that mean for the future of energy transition, for geopolitics, and for us as a consumer? Our guest is Guillaume Pitron. Guillaume is a journalist, a documentary maker, and the author of the book, The Rare Metals War, available in all good bookstores and online retailers. As always, you can support the show by giving us a rating and a review on the platform you're listening on. I also want to let you know that HC Insider and HC Group will be media partners at the upcoming Reuters events, Commodity Trading 2021, which on the 9th and 10th of November will unite industry leaders and experts who are challenging what's possible and developing innovative and responsible solutions to deliver a better global commodity trading system. I myself will be moderating two panels at the event one on the super cycle and another on how digitalization is changing the agri-markets. Register for free at reutersevents.com. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Guillaume, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. So we're talking about rare metals and their centrality to a digitized world and also to energy transition, but also the costs, both the environmental costs and some of the the shifts that it will entail in in geopolitics. It's a big story. It's covered in your book, The, The Rare Metals War. Before we dig into the dark side, if you'd like, of of rare metals production, can you just give us a a quick overview, an understanding of of the rare metals themselves, this list of critical metals, and and how they are so central to the digital economy and the energy transition in particular? In the Earth's crust, Paul, you find what we call base metals, which are metals which I found in the Uh, large quantities, large volumes, such as iron, copper, aluminium. But in the Earth's crust, you also have metals which are found in much less quantities. These metals are much more diluted in the Earth's crust, and this is why we call them rare metals. It's not that these metals are really rare, because we can find them everywhere on Earth, even in the depths of the oceans. But because they are diluted, then they are called rare. So let me uh, introduce you to such rare metals as cobalt, tungsten, rare earth, which is a family of 15 rare metals, but also gallium, indium, antimony. Uh, We find about 30 or so of these rare metals. And uh, let me... uh, take you an example to explain how diluted they are. In a mine of iron, for example, you'll find rare earths, a rare earth whose name is a neodymium, as a byproduct of an iron mine. And on average, you will find 1,000 less times neodymium than iron in an iron mine, which means that if you extract and refine one kilogram of iron, well, as a byproduct, you'll get only one gram of neodymium. So that tells you why we call them rare. The European Union, but also the United States, have introduced and coined the phrase, the word of critical metals. These metals are called critical, not only because they are rare, but because there is a risk that we could face, we in the United States or in Europe, shortages of supply. And the list of critical metals in Europe and in the United States have grown over the last years. I remember back in 2011, there were probably in Europe like 14 or 15 critical metals. And now we have gone up to 30 uh, critical metals. And I think the figures in the United States is probably 35 critical metals. So these metals are not necessarily rare. We not have defined into the list of these metals silicium metal, which is absolutely not rare. I mean, silicium is a very abundant uh, mineral. But the thing is, because the production of these metals is concentrated in specific countries, 
which actually hold most of the production of these metals, then there is a risk, a geopolitical risk, that we would run out of supplies because a country could say, I'm stopping the exports. And this is why they're called critical. So welcome to the world of rare and critical metals and the properties, the chemical and physical properties of these metals are such that they have become absolutely unavoidable, absolutely necessary uh, for uh, making the energy transition and the digital transition possible. A neodymium is a good example of, can you just, using just that one metal, give us an example of how it is so crucial to energy transition it, itself acting as a, a magnet? Yeah, well, uh, you're mentioning the magnet, so let's talk about uh, neodymium and also dysprosium or samarium, which are three different rare earths, this specific family of rare metals. And actually, in magnets, which you have in the phone, in your phone, in your smartphone, in your pocket, but also in a magnet that you may find in most of the electricity vehicles that run today on Earth, you will find neodymium, iron, and boron. And alloy, this alloy of three different metals, including neodymium, which is a rare earth, will make the magnets extremely powerful, much more powerful than the present generation of magnets, which were much bigger and, and less powerful. So basically, you will use these magnets for making electric motors. An electric motor could be made out of copper, but the thing is, you will need a much, a much bigger amount, a much higher volume of copper in order to come up with the same results with a motor which would be as efficient as a neodymium iron boron magnet motor. And that will probably impact, certainly impact the weight of the car, of the electric car. Now, as you know, the this is very strategic to actually make an electric car which is as light as possible in order to guarantee the best autonomy possible. So the constructors of electric cars will prefer to turn to uh, magnets of rare earths in order to guarantee the best autonomy possible for the cars. So that gives you a simple example of how important these metals are for the energy transition, for the green technologies transition. Perfect. And as you say, the challenge is not necessarily prevalency, but it is processing extracting these very dilute metals and concentrating them up. And the book starts off, and this is really where the story, our story begins, on I think you're in uh, Gangzhou in, in Jiangxi province in China, trying to get uh, by, into the, beyond the fence of, of a rare metals mine, and the stark environmental damage that is caused when you're trying to extract and process these metals on scale. Before we come into why why that's in China and not in southern France or the Midwestern United States, where there are other deposits and previous processing. Can you just give us some sense of the environmental damage, perhaps through the lens of what you saw and describe in the book? Mm -hmm. Well, first, my job is a reporter and I'm an on-the-field reporter, so I try to speak about what I've seen. I try to be a witness about what I've seen. So basically for this book, The Rare Metals War, I've been traveling all around the world in various mines, including uh, Chinese mines, where we find most of the rare earths uh, on, on, on Earth. And one region where we find deposits and extraction and refining of these rare earths is the southern uh, part of the east coast of China. In this province, where in the middle of nowhere after driving for hundreds of kilometers, I have actually met with some of the of these illegal miners who are extracting and refining these these rivers. And whether you are in the Jiangxi province or in the inner autonomous region of inner Mongolia, northwest of Beijing, the people who are participating in the extraction of these metals all will witness and tell you about the strong ecological cost of extracting these metals because they need to be or because they are denuded so you need to remove a lot of rocks in order to uh, extract the, the rock and then turn the rock into a mineral and then you need to uh, use a lot of chemicals a lot of water in order to turn the mineral and refine it and turn it into a metal it's going to be the amount of chemicals and the time spent and the energy spent in order to turn the rock into a kg of rare earths will be extremely huge, much bigger than if you do the same with, with, with iron, as you understand. And in the regions of Baotou, uh, in the city of Baotou, northwest of Beijing, where I've been several times, and last time in 2019, what you see, lakes 
artificial lakes. One lake, more more specifically, was named the Rikrang Dam, where all this uh, chemicals and 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 water, dirty waters, emanating from the refining the refining of rare earths, is just being dumped without any treatment. And people around the area talk about uh, cancers. They are cancer villages, the agricultures, the farmers cannot grow anything on their lands because the lands have become just not exploitable anymore due to the pollution. Some experts of the rarest industry officials talk to me openly about radioactivity because you need to extract and separate the rare earths from uranium and thorium. So the extract the separation process will reject radioactivity so that these are UD impact. Officials talk about refining industries, uh, industries being completely irresponsible, non-responsible, even if the rules apply, are supposed to exist, they don't apply on the field. So it's very impressive to see the dark side of these green technologies, which are made of metals, which are actually actually being extracted and refined in very dirty conditions. And just to finish, Vivian Vu, at the time, a couple of years ago, a very prominent specialist of rare earths in China, said to me very openly, China has devastated its environment to feed the rest of the world with rare earths. So we we need to be conscious of that. You say, you allude to that, you talk to that in the book and say, it's not clear who got the better side of the deal. I want to focus in on this because this is a very, before we talk about the Chinese government's long-term plans, um, Plan 863 and so forth, all these things, about a very long-term strategic vision about how they wanted to capture these industries, the West started this process by essentially seeking to offshore the pollution caused by the rise in, in these new technologies. And this stems way back to the 50s, right? Can you just help us understand a little bit about how it came about the West started to move these very environmentally impactful industries to China? And then we'll talk about why China wanted to take them on and why actually that was part of quite, or could be argued, a quite a clear plan to move up that value chain you know, and start to dominate those industries. Sure. The thing is, when we discuss about that poll, many of the people who listen to us might say, how did I never heard about that? I've never figured out that green was not that green. And that at some point, if you want to make something green, you need to do something dirty at some point. And we don't know that because we don't have the mines. I mean, there is no mine in France. There is no few mines in Europe and few mines in the United States. But there used to be a time where the Western world used to have lots of mines and was actually exploiting the minerals and metals for its own needs. And the United States, notably back in the 80s, were the leaders of the production of rare earths in the world. And this is a mine that was named is Mountain Pass, which at the time, at the time was being uh, exploited by a U.S. company, whose name was Molly Corp. This is uh, basically in California, close to Las Vegas. And the exploitation and refining of rare earths over there was dirty. The Australians, uh, the Australians at the same time, were also exploiting rare earths in, in the region of Western Australia. Linus was a company exploiting these rare earths, and this was dirty. And the French at the time were refining the rare earths, and uh, it was dirty. So everyone was, you know, very well aware in the Western world of how dirty this business was. And the thing at the same time, populations, neighboring communities wanted the world to be cleaner because. Uh, you know, understanding of the ecological transition was was gaining ground even back in the 80s. And basically, countries, states, companies just decided they would just shut down these activities because they were not acceptable from an environmental standpoint. And that doesn't mean that suddenly from one day to another, we wouldn't need these rare earths and other metals anymore. That means that other countries at the same time would say, hmm, these rivers, we can exploit them for you guys. And why don't you just close your mines, shut your mines on one side, but we'll reopen other mines on the other side so that we'll keep producing these metals for the rest of the world. And back in the 80s, the Chinese started to say that to us and started to say, the environmental, uh, the environment is not a problem for us. We don't care about the environment. <laughs> they will regret that. Today, they do regret that. But at the time, they didn't care much about the ecological issues. And they started to 
extract and refine these prayers in the conditions that we have just talked about instead of us. So basically, everyone was happy in this process. The West was happy because we were not undergoing the huge pollution problems due to the refining of rare earths and other critical metals. And the other side, the Chinese were getting richer and they were slowly catching up the delays of that they had experienced for the last uh, d- decades. And that was happy globalization. That was perfect. And the rare earths were being produced as a, at a low rate, at a low price, much lower than if the West had to produce them. And the West could get the rare earths at a cheaper price without having the pollution. So what we did is actually, we, as you said, we offshored the pollution. We relocated the pollution of these metals, but we offshored the pollution of the green technologies. And the world has come to get organized in that respect between those who are dirty and those who pretend to be clean. And it's true for everything, but it's also true for the green technologies. And if I think about the at the core of your book is these two strands. One is by no means anti or against energy transition, very much supportive of it, but to take a full accounting that your Tesla is not it might be clean at the moment you drive it in terms of CO2 emissions, but if you take a, an accounting of all the minerals within it and how they were produced, we as a world need to look at that and understand that. And then secondly is this more, in some ways, this story of how this then unfolded. And, and as you say in the 1980s when China said we don't care about the environment, actually there was part of a very strategic plan. You talk about in your book 863, Plan 863, this idea that if they were to start to to undercut these industries and then start a process of not only onshoring the pollution and the dark side of those industries, but also collecting and gathering the IP, the idea would be that at some point they would become dominant in those industries, which would then be those industries themselves are essentially the future industry. It might be great that the United States has a a fully functioning and dominance in hydrocarbon production and refining. But that's not going to be very useful in 30 years' time if we are an electrified world and it's the mineral, the metals, the rare metals that are the key to the control of the value of that industry. Can you talk us through this dumping, which I think is a reasonable umbrella term for the whole scenario playing out. And there are some just startling, not only facts, but also sort of descriptions about how this came about and how how targeted the Chinese were and, and how industries in the West had little choice if they were to remain economically viable, but also perhaps the, the complacency or even complicity of politicians in the West in this transfer of technology and IP. Uh, many things to say here, but basically uh, we have understood at that point that the China is today in other countries where these critical minerals are uh, concentrated and exploited, such as the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, which exploits cobalt, uh, two-thirds of the exploitation of uh, cobalt in the world, but also uh, other mining countries such as Kazakhstan, Russia, Bolivia, Chile, are paying a certain price from an ecological viewpoint in order for the client countries to uh, proclaim their clean. And uh, and as you said, regarding an electric car, it is as clean as the kind of metals which are in the battery or in the motor of the car. And an electric car is also as clean as a, as a type of electricity which is being uh, produced for uh, recharging the battery of the car and whether the electricity is produced by coal or nuclear electricity or is beginning produced by natural gas or or so-called green technologies it will impact the co2 emissions of the car during all its life cycle but let's go back to the to the point that you were making in your question china has paid a huge price from a pure environmental viewpoint in order to keep the world going green but at some point what happens is that china has become a major player in the rare metals and critical metal space. When we look today at a map, various maps, including uh, maps produced by the European Commission of the world production of rare metals, this production is much more concentrated than the world production of gas or oil. We very quickly come to the conclusion that China is producing most of these rare metals and critical metals. 
China produces probably 40% of the world production of rare metals today. But don't forget that today, like 13, 14, 15 countries account for the uh, organization of exporting countries of, of petrol. But China accounts by itself for 40% of the production of critical metals. So what happens when a country which has the ambitions of China, such as China, realizes that it's actually holding such a, a huge bunch of the production of such a production of strategic metals. And this country like China will not agree for a long time to just sell a kilogram of these metals, uh, $2 a kilo. This country suddenly understands that it can go down the value chain. And starting the beginning of the century, the 21st century, we heard Chinese officials saying, we're going to export less of these metals to the rest of the world. And the quotas, the exporting quotas, will drop year after year. And we, the Chinese, will keep the minerals, but actually we'll make the metals. We'll keep the metals and we'll stop exporting them for part of them, but we'll produce alloys and we'll produce magnets. We'll stop producing uh, exporting magnets, but actually we will produce uh, electric cars and we produce batteries, and we produce end products. So we'll not uh, you know, sell everything we do at a cheap price. We'll sell the finished product at a high price. So the Chinese has, have been very clever putting forward a very clever strategy over the decades of going down the value chain in order to get richer. That probably explains to a large degree why the Trump administration has been willing to uh, re-equilibrate the trade balance between the United States and China, because China was not only selling jeans and, and, and toys, but China was selling high-end technologies with high, high value added, thanks to this, among other things, to this strategy of going down the value chain of rare metals. And we come to a point where we in the West start to understand that we are in the process of losing the race towards green technologies and the economic value we can get out of them if China is producing the metals of them, but also selling to the rest of the world solar panels, wind turbines, electric batteries, and electric cars. In the book, as you describe it, right, this wasn't a covert plan even, right? It was very, it was stated even in the year, in the 80s, I keep mentioning it, this is this 863 plan, here's seven industries that we want to dominate over the next half a century. And can you just talk about the mechanism there? Because it was it was sort of market forces. They they would under or it would be very low production prices because they didn't have the same environmental requirements, remediation and prevention that you had, for example, Mountain Pass. You know, Molly Corp got in all sorts of trouble and eventually went bankrupt as a result of environmental fines. They would so they'd have low prices, but then they would start to insist, you know, on on the if companies want to operate, they had to go there, they had to yield up their IP. But also, as you say, if you start introducing quotas, you have no choice. I think that you know the Japanese realized what you know in 2010 you have this massive spike in, in rare earth prices as directly tied to that quota system, you know, and the shockwaves that sent through the, the market. Yeah. Basically, Chinese soon made their Japanese partners uh, counterparts, I would say back in the first decade of the 20th to 21st century, they made them soon understand in Tokyo that they were having a huge asset within their hands. And that in case of geopolitical tensions between China and Japan over some islands of Senkaku in southern Sea of China, they could retaliate by just stopping the exports of these rares, which are absolutely critical for the rest of the world, especially for the Japanese high-tech industry. China today probably produces between 75 and 95% of the rare earths in the world. So this is absolutely huge. And given the importance of rare earths everywhere, in magnets, in phones, in cars, in defense industries, if they stop these exports, this is a nightmare for the importing country. And over geopolitical turbulences back in 2010 between China and Japan, the rare earths were suddenly the, the exportations of rare earths from China to Japan and also the United States were suddenly stopped for six months. So that was a way to retaliate and then realize that it's getting not only a commercial issue, but it's getting a diplomatic issue. And this is something the West starting to understand back in 2010-11. And actually, they didn't even know the existence of rare earths because they had forgotten about that. So 
you, you see what China can do out of this dominance. The other thing is, for, for the last years, uh, for the last decades, I would say, the Chinese said first to the Western clients, we're not going to export that many rare earths. That was a huge existential question, debate for the Western clients, because either their industries would stop running because of lack of raw materials, or, and this is what the Chinese said, the Chinese said, why don't you just uh, you know, relocate your industries to China? In China, if you come to China, you won't have any uh, restrictions to export of any resource. So basically, if you export your industries, then you will have you will have the possibility to to run your industries higher. And we in the West relocated our industries to China for the last decades for many reasons because the currency in China is underevaluated, because the labor force is cheap, because China is a huge market of 1.4 billion people who are eager to buy new products and to consume. But the Western industries also came for some part. This is one of the reasons, because they were lacking the resource that was necessary that was necessary to that were necessary to to run their industries. And this has accelerated the relocation process, not only of the industries, but also of the research and the research and development departments, of the, the, the gray cells, uh, that is this uh, engineers coming from the West would actually come to China to 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 develop the research and development in China. And and when a Western company comes to China, it has to sign a joint venture most of the times with a Chinese partner. And this joint venture is owned by at least 51 person by a Chinese entity. And once a researcher in the Tsinghua University in China once told me the Westerners haven't understood the ability of the Chinese to learn. And this is what the Chinese did. They learned a lot. They learned from the Western know-how. They learned from our patent. And they started to copy our patent. And then they started to do their own patents. And they started to innovate with innovations made in China. And this helps us understand why the Chinese has become so strong and so smart in developing uh, quantum satellites, 5G device, and other supercalculators. They have become, they have touched the technological horizon where they're getting actually better than the Westerners in, in some specific industries. And the, the rare metal strategy of Beijing helps us understand uh, how this strategy has unfolded and where it has taken them today with a remarkable success. Yeah, and I think that's there's nothing quite so emblematic of that in the book than the story about the fact that an F-35, the United States' most sophisticated warplane, most sophisticated warplane in the world, one component, a magnet, is made in China. Yeah, exactly. And actually, F-35 probably holds more than 400 kilograms of rare earths for every jet, every fighter jet. And more generally, the rare earths are being used by the defense industry of every country, and more specifically by the U.S. defense industry for also uh, smart bombings. Basically, the volumes at stake are not that big uh, comparing to the volumes used in the civil industry, but still, these components are absolutely strategic. And the United States have understood probably starting from the moment where they had to uh, experience the Chinese embargo back in 2010, that they were very much dependent of the Chinese supplies for these defense industries. And uh, over the last decade, under the Obama administration, and especially the Trump administration, and still going on with the Biden administration, they have tried to put some, uh, to develop a strategy of not depending upon Chinese supplies. And it takes a long time, but that notably implies that the United States will actually reopen the mountain pass mine that was once closed due to ecological reasons, as we, as we mentioned before. And this is what they are doing now. The, the, the mountain pass mine, which is being exploited by a new company whose name is ML Resource, is actually extracting the minerals, yeah, the, the rock and the minerals, in order to, to produce uh, rare earth metals for the United States. The thing is, the United States don't have the refining industry. They have closed it too. So they need today to export the mineral in China to be, ref to be refined as a metal. You see, 
that doesn't make any sense if you have the mine, but if you don't have the refining manufacturing. So the United States need to develop, and this is what they're doing, but it's going to take time to reopen a manufacturing process in order to be able to be uh, sovereign from a mineral viewpoint. And they need to do the same with the magnet industries. And this is notably due to the fact that they need to be uh, independent for, the, for their uh, defense industry. Yeah. This has been quite a quiet story, at least outside of diplomatic and circles for the last decade, ultimately because we've had a global trough in commodity prices, which has meant that there hasn't been the economic forces, even for those organizations wanting to create rare earth mines, rare metals mines around the world, because prices have been so low. You know, we're now in a stage where prices are really starting to rocket back up. You can just see that, whether it's to do with lithium, all in expectation of the energy transition and disruption as a result of COVID, which again, I think put in stark relief some of the fragility of these supply chains, you know, and how China has uh, become sort of the manufacturer of the world. So I want to move on at the final section and talk about the environmental piece and where that currently stands. But as of right now, is this a well-recognized problem or is it still, what shocks do we expect to see over the next five years as prices ramp up and the Chinese control and the ability just to completely shut off the flows of these metals, where would we stand then? Sure. Well, every day we are moving more towards a green electricity world, so-called green electricity world. Every day, the electricity mix of Western countries is getting more uh, diversified. Every day, there is more um, electricity and clean electricity into this energy mix, electricity mix. So every day, there is actually more needs for producing uh, for, for, for these metals. And back in May of this year, the International Energy Agency produced a very interesting document, basically saying that if we want to respect the Paris Agreements signed back in 2015 and try to you know, limit the global warming by 1.5 or 2 degrees by the end of the century, that means that within the next 20 years, so within uh, until 2040, the world will need to produce 42 times more lithium than in 2020. And it will need to produce 25 more graphite, 20, 21 more cobalt, cobalt, 19 more nickel, and seven times more rare earths in 2040s and in 2020. So every day in the news today, you suddenly have these huge issues of how we get these damned minerals for making the green energy transition possible. And that is starting to really be being a huge concern for companies, but also for states, because once they look at the map of uh, the pro countries producing these, these metals for the rest of the world, they understand very quickly that China holds a good bunch of them and that China will not make any present to us. So every day, this understanding that we are moving from one dependency on oil towards a new dependency towards rare metals and critical metals, every day, this understanding is taking shape and it's getting more clear in the leaders' mindsets. So we see in the United States this understanding probably better than anywhere else due to the dependency of the United States over Chinese supplies for the defense industry. This is getting a matter of national security. We understand that also the Japanese understand that very well because uh, you know they don't want to be dependent over the Chinese supplies due to historical tensions and now we see the Japanese investing notably in the rare earth sector of Australia in order to get alternative source of rare earths coming directly from Australia we start to see in Europe these countries reacting more because they need to they understand that the electric batteries market and the electric cars market which accounts for millions of jobs in Europe, will not be possible if we don't actually secure supplies of lithium. And the European countries want to get lithium from various countries in the world, including Australia and, and Latin American countries. They also want to produce lithium on their own. And we see every day popping up new projects of mining of lithium in UK, in Portugal, in Spain, in Austria, in France, in Germany, in order to, to secure part of our, of our own needs. So 
now I think the understanding is 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 clear. I wouldn't have said that a couple of years ago. I've been working on this issue for ten years, and back five years ago, this understanding was absolutely not clear. But today, as the energy transition tries to accelerate, we understand that we are getting into a new world, a new green world, with new geopolitical challenges ahead. And I guess they're ultimately playing catch up in terms of developing that refining and processing manufacturing capability, which was lost as a result of decades ago making that decision to not support those industries. One of the sort of the ending themes of the book is that this is part of a much broader, I guess, strategies by any country. I don't want to make it sound like this is a, you know, unique to China, where Indonesia have tried it, you know, multiple jurisdictions have tried it, where it's to to undercut an industry or to not to lower prices because there isn't the attention to the environment or other concerns, you know, ESG and so forth. We're going through a time of the, the right now where society is demanding transparency, demanding ESG be considered in the manufacture of all number of products, at least <laughs> those that we can see. And as you quite rightly point out, a lot of this stuff is very far away from our eyes. And it's a very valid point raised by a lot of people, you know, in the oil and gas industry, well, how green is a Tesla? But before we get onto that, is there an understanding now that, I mean, how do you thread that needle where society wants ESG to be a consideration, but yet we know that that makes production of some of these key industries too expensive in the West, and ultimately you end up with them going to other regions, other countries that have no policies around that. In fact, that's their competitive advantage almost. Sure. Well, I think the consumer wants to get the cheaper and cheaper products and what drives us is basically the ability to get the best for the cheapest price so once you understand that well industrials manufacturers will just follow that trend and try to get the metals from uh, from um, whatever is the human and the environmental costs of the extraction and refining of these metals as long as we get them at the best price possible this is what we'll do now comes also and that comes to clash this research for a lower cost world that comes to clash with as you said a new new requests by consumers and states that resources should be exploited in better environmental and human uh, more respectful uh, ways, uh, more respectful of the environment and, and of humans. And due to this pressure, pressure by the public opinion and the consumers, we have seen over the last decades, uh, over the last years, sorry, uh, notably in the United States, in Europe, in France, new regulations being passed so that industries investigate where the uh, minerals come from. And they must make sure that these minerals have been exploited in the in respectful conditions of humans and the environment. Uh, you must know your customer, and uh, you uh, and that comes at a cost because on the other side of the exploiting chain, uh, that means that Western standards apply to those who produce the minerals themselves, and that will certainly come at a price at a higher price. So, in a way, that is a good news, and in a way. Uh, once again, the green energy transition must be done. It's, I mean, there is no question that we should remain sticked to oil and, and coal. But the question is, know that we have said that we would do this transition, that we, we understand that it comes with new challenges. Know that we understand that renewable technologies are not green. Renewable technologies cannot be easily recycled. That it doesn't necessarily ultimately come with uh, better human spirits. How do we do to mitigate the costs, the environmental costs of this transition? And this is where the, the ethical uh, sourcing of these metals is extremely important. And this is also where the recycling of these metals is getting extremely important. And more generally speaking, the circular economy of these metals of the green technologies is getting important. And if you can get your metals uh, recycled from an urban mine, rather than going back to Congo or China or Kazakhstan or Bolivia to actually dig a deeper hole, well, th that will make sense from an environmental viewpoint. So these two contradictory uh, uh, searches, uh, requests by the consumer, lower cost, but at the same time a more responsible world, are coming to clash together. But the good news is that I think uh, this clash uh, today, as I see today, the country and the uh, and, and, and the industries especially will have to to respect these regulations and the mining space 
will be more responsible tomorrow than what it is today. Mm. And that, that takes us back to China and this rather bleak statement that the country might have um, gained preeminence in the production of many of the hardware, much of the hardware, the metals that are required for the, the future of the planet, but it's come at a terrible price and a price maybe that wasn't worth paying. I think in, in one part of your book, you talk about 80% of the groundwater being poisoned. Where is China with that right now? Well, this is a discussion that was, uh, I remember I had with, with one uh, researcher in China who said, if we had to uh, make a cost-benefit analysis of this uh, curse <laughs> that we have uh, go through by accepting to, uh, to produce these metals for the rest of the world, I'm not sure the Chinese have, have, have really uh, you know, benefited of this whole situation. And that's very shocking to, to, to hear the Chinese saying this. To hear that uh, when you have to go through the, the environmental costs of this green uh, energy transition, I think uh, the, the the benefits can be really uh, really discussed and debated. Well, the Chinese today, like we the Europeans, but even stronger, they want a greener world. The Chinese know better than anyone else what it costs to produce to be the ma- the manufacturer of the world. The Chinese have been very happy for their economic growth to produce whatever kind of produce, uh, products to, for the rest of the world, but they, they really know what it, comes, what it costs in terms of water pollution, soil pollution, and especially air pollution. And uh, the question of the sustainability of the actual economic model of growth is China. This question has started to, to raise into the debates back in 2008, I would say, when, among other things, a Chinese documentary maker, a lady whose name I forgot, on the top of my head, I forgot her name, but she self-produced a documentary whose name is Under the Dome. And by the dome, she meant the dome of air pollution. And this is very impressive when you go to Chinese cities to see the air pollution due, among other things, by the electricity power plants, the coal electricity power plants. And uh, at the end of uh, the, the winter, when these electricity power plants uh, have run for six months, hundred percent of the time to produce heat in homes. The the, the Chinese uh, inhabitants of a city haven't seen the sun for six months, and then they see the sun after six months of just artificial cloud above their heads, and they take their smartphones and take a picture of the sun, and we're in March, and this is what I've heard in Sichuan when I was uh, reporting in Sichuan back in 2017. So this is getting really important in China and, and, and the demonstration in China, which are by the way forbidden, gain importance. First reason for social unrest in China is due to environmental concerns and notably air pollution. So the Chinese don't want to be anymore the countries which pays a very high environmental cost, health costs for their own economic growth, but also for the economic growth of the rest of the world. They want to have not only quantity of growth, but quality of growth. And it has pushed for the last years the Communist Party to actually engage a shift towards uh, lighter industries, greener industries, less heavy industries, in order to, to, to mitigate the environmental cost of this developing model. So the Chinese Communist Party is ready to actually lower the, trans- the, the economic growth of China, providing that the uh, new uh, lower middle class in China is getting more satisfied with their environmental, uh, uh, ecologic environment. So th- that, that is getting important, obviously, yes. Which will, will inevitably lead to a rise in prices over these rare metals and yeah because if you if you if you feature in the cost in the kg of rare metal the price of the hospital to treat the cancers of the people who live around the mines and the and the artificial dumps where the waters are being rejected actually that adds up to the price at the end and yes it will have a price it will it will mean that rare metals will be more expensive so that will probably mean that uh, electric cars will be more expensive not necessarily uh, uh, smartphones because uh, you know uh, the total price of commodities in a smartphone is very low comparing to the total price of a smartphone but that would make sense to say that it will probably come at a it will mean that the electric vehicles will be more expensive mm. The book is called The Rare Metals War. Is that hyperbole or does this have the potential to cause real 
geopolitical tension, even potentially war, in the future? The thing is, it's called war because it's an economic war. As we have mentioned, we understand what, that this is an economic war which is being engaged by China, and we, the West, haven't really understood. And it, take, it took time for us to understand that. What I also want to mention uh, before clearly answering your question is that the greener world will be a more geopolitically complex world. As you understand, we'll need huge quantities of these metals and minerals in the future. Where are we going to get them? Which countries are getting to get more powerful in the future because they'll have the resource? Which will be the next Saudi Arabia's of lithium, copper, graphite, cobalt, nickel? We see a new geopolitics of green energy is taking shape. Obviously, yes. This summer, Afghanistan, as you know, the United States left Afghanistan, and the Chinese have very quickly said that they were interested in developing commercial uh, ties with Afghanistan. Notably because the Afghanistan has so much, the Afghans have so much lithium and rare earth reserves. What will we do out of these reserves? Will Afghanistan become an important partner for the Chinese in the future in order to secure lithium and rare earths? I'm not sure about that, but this question suddenly come to the surface and we see this greener world coming up with new new balance of powers and games, geopolitical games between countries which can produce a resource and those which need the resource for their own development. Today, not a single bullet has been shot for securing the most uh, strategic assets, mining areas of these metals. But tomorrow, what will happen? I, I don't know. What I just know is that if we look back at the last century, many conflicts uh, have been waged directly or by proxy for securing oil. And if we don't make this green energy revolution a revolution of a state of mind, of the way we consume, there is a risk that we will just repeat history, but by just you know shifting the problems from oil to rare metals, and this could end up with the same results at the end. So will we be wise enough not to shoot one bullet in order to secure the most strategic supplies? That I will answer that because I have no idea. But what has been until now, until today, an economic war could become more than that in the future if we don't uh, make this energy transition a wise transition. Yeah, and I think very wise words. It's been a, a pleasure having you on. Before I let you go, I know that uh, you've recently published your next book, and excuse the French, uh, L'Enfer Numérique. I can say a word about it if you want. The genesis of that book started in this book, which is yeah. essentially that idea of accounting for the digital world and its impacts in the material world. And you have this startling fact around energy consumed of sending an email. If you could just give us a couple of minutes on it and then you know we'll, we'll let you go. But I, I look forward to having you back on to talk about your next book when it's translated. Yeah, it would be a pleasure to speak to you about this next book, which, by the way, will be published uh, end of 2022 in the United States. Uh, so please invite me on your show. But basically, the story is this one. Uh, my publisher uh, said to me, why don't you investigate uh, around the world about what it costs to send an email or to watch uh, a video or to send a, or, to, or to like someone's uh, Facebook profile. Uh, when, when, I, when I like uh, your profile on the social network, even if you're two meters away from me, the like will not go from my phone to your phone. The like will actually travel around the world. It will go through wire networks under the earth, under the oceans. It will be uh, replicated in several data centers around the world, notably in the United States. It could go up to the Arctic Circle where our data are being kept cold because uh, the servers are heating. And then it will go back to your phone, which is two meters away from me. And that tells us that when we talk about the digital industries as technologies which allow us to make our world more virtual, more dematerialized. When we talk about uh, the data centers are being part of the cloud, nothing is true. And actually, the virtual world comes at a huge material cost. And I think we must um, investigate and counter-investigate this narrative that has been offered by capitalistic industries and the digital industries, that a more 
digital world will be more virtual and could be necessarily could only come up with uh, good ecological results in order to face climate change and the loss of biodiversity. I really question that, and this is a 300-page book which has taken me across the world, but literally following the path, the trail of a like, of an email, of a picture, in order to tell you that a non-material world, a virtual world, will be an extremely materialistic world. And remind us how much power was, you have this fact in, in the current book about how much power is consumed by a single email. It was something like a light bulb for a day. Yeah, for an hour. But basically, uh, that tells us that if you send an email with an attached uh, document, a big attached document on it, it would probably emit uh, 20 grams of CO2 in the air. You must keep in mind that if you run into a car, you would probably emit 120 grams of CO2 per kilometer. So one email with an attached piece means that you it is as if you were driving for uh, you know 150 meters. So think about it when you reply to everyone in a 50 uh, in when you have 50 friends and you reply to 53 50 friends at the same time in your email. Digital technologies today uh, probably uh, consume 10 percent of the world electricity. And this electricity is among other things produced by coal. So that means about 4% of the world's CO2 emissions, which is much more than the civil aerial industry. So yeah, we need to keep that in mind. This is a question to be addressed, whether digital technologies help reduce the human impact on environment or on the contrary, accelerate the human impact on the environment. And I think that would be a very, very uh, important and hot environmental topic for the next decades. Your current book, The Rare Metals War, is out. It's available on all good bookstores. And um, I really appreciate having you on. It's been a fascinating read. It's been very much an eye-opening discussion. And uh, yeah, look forward to having you on to discuss the, your latest book when it's appropriate. Thank you very much, Paul. I look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show, please give us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. To find out more about HC Insider and Human Capital, a search firm dedicated to the commodities sector, go to www.hcinsider.global, where you'll find more original content on the commodities sector and more details on our offerings as a search firm and our locations around the world. Thanks again for listening. Thank you.